Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to our final webinar for this term uh, within the War Crimes Research Group series, broadly speaking. Today, I'm very happy and extremely grateful that I have two uh, leading uh, scholars in international law, a former professor of mine, Professor Simon Chesterman, uh, when I was at the NYU, and a very, very good friend of mine and, and leading scholar, Lauri Malkso, who will provide us, they will give a joint webinar, both on uh, Russia and China and international law. Before I give the floor to our two speakers, I will introduce them briefly, although I don't think they need a, a proper introduction here, so it will be a very brief introduction, and then we will start our discussion, you know, about uh, the theme of this uh, webinar. So Simon Chester Chesterman is Dean and Provost Chair Professor of the National University of Singapore Faculty of Law and Senior Director of Artificial Intelligence Governance at uh, Artificial Intelligence Singapore. He's also editor of the Asian Journal of International Law, co-president of the Law School's Global League. Uh, Simon has written so many books and edited, co-edited books, including the last one about artificial intelligence with the robots regulating artificial intelligence and the limits of law, but also very, uh, books related to the United Nations law and practice uh, about surveillance, um, and the first book that I remember on humanitarian intervention, Just War or Just Peace. Lowry, Professor Lowry Maltzo is a professor of, at the University of Tartu, professor of international law in Estonia. He's a member of the Institut de Droit International and the Estonian Academy of Sciences. Uh, Lowry has authored the monograph, Russian Approaches to International Law and co-authored Russia and the European Court of Human Rights and has written many, many articles on the history and theory of international law in Russia and the Soviet Union. Uh, so today we will talk about the rise uh, of China and the return of Russia. And I would like to initiate this discussion between Lowry and Simon by referring back to the 2016 joint declaration between Russia and China and international law. How would you assess this declaration, you know, these fundamental principles of international law, their own understanding in the current state of affairs? When we talk about the crisis or not of international law, the backlash against multilateralism, how do you see their relevance in 2021? Thank you very much. Simon, you have the floor. So thanks very much, Maria, and it's a pleasure to be joining your students virtually, at least, and to be back again virtually with, with Lowry, who, uh, who I've had long and interesting discussions with, but uh, too far, we've, too long we've been apart. Um, so I, I think documents like this um, come up periodically. Uh, and to me, what's interesting is both what's said and what's unsaid. So this document, among other things, 2016, uh, it's a time when China is on the rise. Uh, it's uh, when uh, the it's just before the South China Sea arbitration decision comes down, but it's two years after Russia has annexed what many of us thought was illegally uh, Crimea. Uh, and so, what said? Well, it's uh, it's an unremarkable document in all sorts of ways. It talks about sovereign equality. It talks about peaceful development, but also talks about respecting the legitimate interests of great powers. Uh, and so it doesn't use the word great powers, however, uh, but that, that's sort of what's unsaid. So let me just set, throw a few ideas out in, in three broad areas of, about international law and power, about whether countries like China, I'll focus on China, are revolutionary or evolutionary, uh, and then very briefly on exceptions and rules uh, and how that applies to great powers. So on the larger question of power, I mean, international law has always been a bit uncomfortable talking about, thinking about power. Um, the joint declaration, as I said, reiterates the central myth of public international law, which is sovereign equality, that China has as many rights and as many obligations as Tuvalu. Um, at the same time, the two powers that uh, issued this joint declaration are both veto-wielding members of the UN Security Council with nuclear powers that really see themselves as the major opposition, it would be argued, to Western powers, which, which are the other powers on the UN Security Council. And now I've long wondered why we international lawyers are so uncomfortable with power. I've come up with two possible reasons. Um, the first is that international law likes to distinguish itself from international relations, and international lawyers like to distinguish themselves from IR theorists. Um, uh, and the history of international law in many ways 
uh, is an attempt for law to become more than just one policy justification among others. So that's, that's one part of the reason why I think we're a bit uncomfortable about power. The second is domestically, lawyers, at least in Western governments, in Western countries that uh, embrace the rule of law in theory and practice, tend to regard power as anathema to the rule of law. Now, switch to China, Chinese lawyers aren't quite so naive. The Chinese legal system has the Supreme People's Court at its, at its apex, but above that is the party. It also reflects China's experience of international law. China, when, the, when Chinese lawyers talk about international law, uh, you will often hear reference to a century of humiliation, uh, which refers to the period from the sort of mid 19th century or late early 19th century uh, through the um, Opium War, through the unequal treaties as they came to be called in the early 20th century, where China came to be regard itself really as, as a, an object of oppression by international law and through international law. Uh, and this continues in some ways today with a very instrumentalist view of international law. In 1996, for example, uh, Jiang Zemin gave a speech to uh, Chinese Communist Party, uh, a seminar on international law, where he argued that China's lack of knowledge about the discipline put it at a strategic disadvantage. And he urged party members to enhance their skills and become adept at using international law as a weapon to defend the interests of the state and to maintain national pride. Now, this is five years before Charles Dunlap popularized the term lawfare in English. And it was only a couple of years after that that the equivalent term in Chinese, Fa Lu Zhan, was explicitly included as part of China's strategic doctrine. And I don't think lawfare features quite so explicitly in any country's strategic doctrine. So that's a little bit about power. What about the, the objectives? What are countries like China trying to do with this power? Are they trying to overturn the system to remake it in their own image uh, or just uh, tweak it to, to move it to their advantage? Now, the Soviet Union was an explicitly revolutionary power. Uh, and I'll leave Laurie to talk about the Russian Federation today. Um, China today uh, is contrary, but I would argue not revolutionary. And we've seen that through various points in its history. Uh, but just focusing on the last 30 years or so, even during the Asian values debates of the 1990s, where China, but also countries like Singapore, where I'm normally based, Malaysia, uh, were pushing a, an Asian values agenda. That's, this was really not a positive political agenda, but really a, a defense against criticism. Um, if we move forward to the early 2000s, back in 2001, there was the start of a language in, uh, in Washington in particular, this is the start of the George W. Bush administration, the first months of 2001, uh, where there was semi-serious talk about containing China, moving from the Clinton doctrine of strategic, strategic partnership to strategic competitors. Um, and some of you will remember the EP3 spy plane incident that 20 years ago was down on Hainan Island. Uh, but the main thing most of you might know from 20 years ago is that there were the September 11, 2001 attacks on the United States, uh, and that really pushed China off the foreign policy agenda for a decade, which was exactly what China wanted. Uh, indeed, under, Ma, under Deng Xiaoping, um, China had embraced a policy of Taoguang Yanghui, which means sort of basically nourish obscurity, keep your light under a bushel and develop your economy. So that when the West sort of turned its attention back to China, it was after the Olympic Games in 2008, it was after China's economy had really taken off. Uh, and at this point, uh, there's really no meaningful way in which China could be contained in the way that at least the, some of the hawks were advocating back in 2001. So what is China trying to do? Occasionally, there are arguments that China is proposing a kind of East failure in opposition to West failure. Um, but I don't take that particularly seriously. Most of what China articulates is, in fact, quite consistent with the joint declaration, which harkens back to other Chinese doctrines like the five, five principles of peaceful coexistence. And if anything, this is really a conservative approach to international or a very traditional Westphalian state-centric sovereignty defending uh, understanding of international law, maybe even a 19th century uh, interpretation of international law, because it doesn't just uh, reiterate the prohibition on the use of force and opposition to non-intervention. Uh, it also expresses a desire for non-interference. Uh, and non-interference and non-intervention were almost interchangeable during the 19th century, but what it meant was that some countries would argue that it was inappropriate even to comment on domestic affairs, quite apart from whether you were planning to intervene in them, uh, even though at that point, uh, war itself was not illegal. Um, and this really highlights now one of the fundamental contradictions in China's own international and domestic policies. 
Um, internally, China continues to identify as socialist, albeit a socialism with Chinese characteristics. Externally, however, China's foreign policy and approach to international law and institutions bears almost no resemblance to that ideology. Uh, it would be hard, for example, to reconcile China socialist legal philosophy with China's embrace of investment treaties, for example. Even the much vaunted Belt Road Initiative is really an economic strategy rather than a normative one. Um, and today, China, despite some of this rhetoric uh, that occasionally comes out, at least at the international level, uh, is very much uh, an active player of the game of international affairs. Uh, it was long suspicious of the UN, for example, uh, at least until 1971, uh, when, uh, at which point it had been rep represented by Taipei, or notional China had been represented by Taipei, and the, the UN Charter still refers to the Republic of China. It's now 50 years since China joined the United Nations, uh, and today it's the ninth largest contributor to peacekeeping operations, and it sends more peacekeepers than all the other P5 members combined. Um, last year, uh, it did lose a bid to uh, have Chinese national run the World International Intellectual Property Organization, uh, which I mentioned partly because China lost this competition and also because one of my alumni from the National University of Singapore happened to win. Uh, but the other reason wasn't just that my candidate was a great guy, uh, but also because China was already heading four of the 15 UN specialized agencies, when I think uh, no other country heads more than one. So China has become much more active, much more involved, much more enmeshed in the international system than certainly the, uh, the period of unequal treaties and the century of humiliation would have, uh, would have suggested. And Chinese um, representatives, uh, so the foreign minister, for example, are at pains to express how its embrace of the rule of law at the international level is a great sacrifice by China, given this history, um, but it's a self-interested sacrifice because so much of what happens today has worked out for China. So China has managed to develop its economy. It's managed to uh, build on a world order that has been, for the most part, peaceful and prosperous without the kind of investment that colonial powers put into running colonies or the kind of security guarantees the United States has offered over the past 70 or so years. So at the moment, China is kind of winning uh, in this battle, uh, although in the, in the last sort of three or four years, it has suffered a number of setbacks, which perhaps we could talk about in terms of its behavior in um, Xinjiang, uh, Hong Kong, uh, and the whole context of the pandemic. So let me stop with, uh, with a final set of observations just about um, the exception and the rule. Uh, because the true test for normative regime, like the international legal order, uh, is whether it can discipline its great powers. The history of the rule of law at the domestic level can be measured by its application to kings and emperors. And the success of the rule of law in many countries, and England is perhaps the, the easiest example to point to, often came in the context of revolutions and, in the English case, the beheadings of some of these monarchs. So China and Russia today, uh, as great powers that did not write the legal order but are active within it and rising within it, are hard cases for international law. Uh, there's a famous observation sometimes attributed to Napoleon that China uh, back in the, uh, in the 19th century was a sleeping giant. Let her lie and sleep, he is said to have warned, for when she awakens, she will shake the world. Um, now, letting China sleep is not a serious option, nor is containing it anymore a serious option. Um, and so one of the dilemmas for international law, and I think going back to Maria's opening, one of the reasons why we sometimes talk about a, a kind of structural challenge to international law is that China, and I would say Russia, are both unusual cases in that they're seeking to rise for a second time. And this is very unusual in world order. Um, one thing that's usually typified world order is that when a great power has risen, it's changed the normative order to suit its interests. Um, but uh, we're in an odd situation where we have both China and arguably Russia rising for a second time. Um, one big difference perhaps is that China's glory days were more than a century ago, whereas Russia's president, his, its current president was alive during its decline. So let me pause here and uh, turn over to Laurie for his take on this. So Laurie, what's your take on the joint declaration? And what are all those troops doing on the border with Ukraine? Well, I'm also very glad to uh, participate in this conversation today. And, um, you know, indeed, it's, it's, it's fascinating to speak about Russia's approaches to international law at the day when uh, Presidents Biden and Putin are, are meeting and I understand discuss, discussing the um, security situation, especially at the Russian-Ukrainian uh, border. Now, when starting from this <clears throat> declaration, I think Simon is right to say that um, 
it's equally fascinating, um, you know, it, what is in there and what isn't. And sometimes this, what is addressed is, is kind of, it's not spoken out, but you can see what it is. And, and I think from, from Russia's viewpoint, um, I think Russia feels very strongly that Moscow was a key participant in, in the making of the foundations of international law in 1945. And I think they have a different interpretation of that, what this uh, you know, United Nations order, global security order was, was meant to be. One of those words that is missing usually in these kinds of documents is actually human rights. I think when, when um, and the other is democracy. Uh, so when r countries like Russia and China, when they are always highlighting state sovereignty and uh, non-intervention, this is also an ind indirect way of, of downplaying um, human rights um, and, and, and you know, democratic features of of state governance in, in, in the constitution of international um, order. And, and I think from Russia's perspective, um, 1945, because of this um, veto power, for example, which was actually, let's not forget, agreed initially in Crimea in, in February 1945 at the conference of, of Yalta, um, the UN system, I think, in the Russian thinking, includes some sort of Schmittian Grossraum for the West, but also for the others, uh, for the other great players. And I think that Russia's problem with international law in our time is, is probably that their sense, which is not a legal idea, but it's more really a pol political, cultural, philosophical, even theological idea, because you know, Russian approaches can only be understood against the backdrop of, I don't know, for example, the messianic ideas that Russia has, has had, for example, as a leader of Eastern Christianity against the West. Otherwise, you can't, you can't fully understand this, why this opposition to the, to the United States and other European leading Western nations in some moments of history. Um, and, and then, so the West, according to this reading, has gone too far or is about going too far. And this, uh, of course, deserves a reaction. So, so I think they, um, it, it, and, and they have become more explicit about it. President Putin has written an article saying that um, Russia and Ukraine are really the same nation. So I, I, I think we're living, as far as Russia is concerned, in quite, quite a dangerous time with these kind of ideas. Yes, we know that the other dangerous point, point is Taiwan. And we also know that legally, China always has entertained this claim that Taiwan, there's, there's one China policy and Taiwan is, is part of um, you know, mainland China. Uh, but, but, but there has been a shift in that regard in, in, in Russian um, public pronouncements. I would say 10 years ago, it would have been very unlikely that the Russian leader would have said that Ukraine, you know, should watch out because it's not really an independent country, or at least shouldn't join the some sort of other other regional group of countries. And now, in a way, Russia Russia does that. And it, unfortunately, it reminds me. This is a very dangerous, maybe provocative uh, parallel, but uh, a little bit um, today's Russia in terms of its political um, worldview of its elites reminds me a little bit of the late years of Weimar Germany, somehow this idea of revanchism, somehow this idea of, uh, you know, our borders are not fully just, because it's not only Ukraine, it's also really about uh, Belarus in a sense that is Belarus like really, uh, you know, can it be allowed to be really independent country because the more difficult the situation of President Lukashenko became, the, 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 the more intense became the talk about intensifying the so-called union state between um, Russia and Ukraine. And therefore, it seems to me that, especially in those Eastern Slav republics, Russia's sort of foreign borders are in this sense poros that Russia really accepted the independence of those countries 
under the silent condition that they belong to the Russian regional space, gross realm, and, and in, de in Belarus, the, the problem is, and this is why Russia is criticizing those extensive ideas of human rights and democracy, they see that it can lead to, you know, I don't know, ideas that what if, what if Belarus should even look towards the West? Uh, what if these ideas, autocratic ideas of government, what if they are antiquated? And again, this creates, you know, problems in the security. If, if Belarus doesn't know anymore where it should belong for historical uh, reasons. So I guess I'll, I'll stop here. And, and of course, in, in this declaration, very fascinating part is, for example, the one concerning dispute resolution in which uh, both countries are making the point that you know, we shouldn't only look at um, uh, judicially binding dis dispute resolution mechanisms, but also political means. But you know, all all smaller neighbors of those countries, they can they have a lot of stories about how diplomatic negotiations go with with greater um, greater powers as they as they are. And also, we know from the history of judicial settlement that at least you know, Soviet Union was quite hostile. Um, towards it, and, and I think Russia hasn't made a full breakthrough either, rather in the context of, of the European um, Court of Human Rights, for example, which in a way features also a little bit interstate dispute settlement uh, elements. Uh, Russia is currently making a step back since at least uh, 2020 constitutional amendments, which basically create a priority of constitutional law and interpretations over the interpretations of international bodies and courts. Uh, thank you very much, both of you, for this uh, introductory, uh, for those introductory comments. Yeah, I was particularly intrigued by this uh, reference to the power concept, you know, and our, our myth uh, among international lawyers, you know, about power and the difference between law and how we consider power to be an anathema, uh, contrary to, to, to China, what Simon said, and, and, and Russia. And I would like, although both of you, you touched upon that, you know, I would like a little bit to, to push further and to ask, how do you see the differences between these two countries when it comes to the instrumentalization of law? Because uh, Simon, you know, spoke about that, that we are talking about this rising again powers. And although uh, Lauri mentioned that Russia considers to be her itself, you know, to be one of the founding contributors, you know, to the international legal order. However, you know, we see a difference into this famous lawfare, as we say, instrumentalization of law uh, by, by both countries. And on top of that, I would like to add to what extent, you know, we can we can tie it up to a little bit when we uh, talk about illiberal states, you know, within this illiberalism, to what extent, you know, there is a particular aspect of instrumentalization of law or maybe not when it comes from both countries. Thank you. Simon? Sure. So, um, so let me let me start not by answering the question directly, but by saying how surprised so many Western observers of China are based on the past two decades, where I think there was an assumption on the part of many that with economic development would come somehow organically a kind of natural understanding that the rule of law should be applied, that there should be constraints on domestic uh, power, uh, and that basically you should become a right-minded, uh, a, a good-thinking international citizen that would liberalize politically at the same time as liberalizing economically. And that didn't happen. Uh, and there's a lot of soul searching. The New York Times did a very interesting piece. There's a whole literature on this. Um, and I think that kind of misunderstands the Chinese conception of power, uh, where power within China really is embodied in an idea of the state. Uh, and you, I mean, this is a slight diversion, but there's a point to it. You mentioned the work I've been doing on artificial intelligence. One of the really fascinating observations, if you look around the world at um, how artificial intelligence and how data is regulated, slight simplify, simplification, but Europe is very much rights-based. Um, so you have the GDPR and so on, this, this recent, this recent um, draft AI Act. The United States dominated by market actors, and China is very relentlessly focused on the state, uh, whether it's data localization uh, or artificial intelligence, it's how to project state power 
and um, and even when they're reigning in tech companies, it's how to project state power. So I think there is a, a kind of real identification with the state. Um, and that's particularly true of the Xi Jinping regime. I mean, I'm among those who kind of joked as he started accruing titles. There was this joke among China observers, and I'm, I'm a marginal observer of China, but people who know China much better than I would say, ah, the more titles he accrues, the weaker he is, because that, that demonstrates desperation. Uh, and Deng Xiaoping at the height of his power famously, the only, only title he had was honorary chair of the Chinese Bridge Association. Um, but I think now that Xi Jinping has essentially abolished term limits, he's written himself into Chinese history, he is the embodiment of power now also. Uh, and so I think China really stands as, as an alternative understanding of um, the nature of power, both domestically uh, and to some extent internationally. And here I, I'll throw to Laurie, because I do think there are differences, um, even though both states have extremely strong leaders. Um, in China, I think the idea of Chinese destiny is of being a great, but also seeing themselves as a responsible power. Um, and it's a very utilitarian approach. It's about sort of developing supply chains, having the Belt Road Initiative to secure China's future. Um, there is an element of the growth realm in the sense of greater China, but as long as you understand China includes Taiwan, Hong Kong, uh, Macau, Tibet, Xinjiang, um, I don't think China has sort of aspirations to territory beyond that. Uh, and that's an interesting comparison with what Laurie, I think, accurately describes as kind of messianic view that you sometimes see in Russia and a much more expansionist uh, understanding of what Russian territory broadly understood or Russian claims to territory uh, reflect. So I'm not sure I'm completely answering the question, but that's at least a response and maybe enough to give Laurie a chance to, to properly answer the question. So power and, and, and how it reflects in those international law approaches. Um, that, was, that this question was discussed a lot during the Soviet periods. In the, in the West, there was almost like a, you know, literary genre um, of discussing whether for the Soviet Union international law is anything more than a kind of uh, basically tool of state politics, the kind of propaganda tool. And, and it's quite interesting that, um, you know, the, the several authors, for example, Pashukhanis in the 1930s, they said very explicitly, for us, international law is simply a, a class struggle or struggle between classes. So we are a state with a different class structure. We use it obviously politically and it, it, uh, it translates in all uh, spheres of international law in his discussion. For example, he says that, uh, you know, pacta sum servanda might generally apply, but if it's in the interest of the one and only communist country of the world to, you know, overturn a treaty, of course they can do, and of course they will do so. So this kind of instrumentalizing, instrumentalizing approach, it's, it's, it's very much at least in the 20th, 20th, century, history, uh, 20th century history of, of the Soviet Union approaches uh, to international law. The other concept that I would also bring in is, for example, my countryman, Rein Müllerson, who used to work in Moscow in the 1980s, he has recently brought in the old concept from the earlier centuries of European history, balance of power, that, that somehow, um, you know, Russia has basically, hasn't had an amazing legal argument um, for, for instance, an annexing Crimea. You know, most countries do not really share this Russia, Russia's perspective, but, but Müllerson says that let's not look into those use ad bellum details. It's about the balance of power. Russia really corrected, and this is a pro-Russian argument, Course. Russia is uh, Russia is correcting basically what uh, what it lost in the moment of weakness. And actually, people who who have studied the history of international treaty law know how important was the question of this. You know, one of the key questions in in international treaties: when can you make exceptions to Pacta Sunt Servanda? Uh, so this this question, uh, the famous London Declaration, I think it was uh, 1870. I don't know, 71, um, but when basically Russia had agreed after the Crimean War, 1856, to 
to basically um, um, not to have a navy in the Black Sea, but uh, later on, when the ch circumstances changed, there was uh, this war between Prussia and, and Germany. It suddenly came in with the with the navy, and that 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 you know kind of changed the treaty, or, or unilaterally or violated it, but also presented with with new facts. So it is it is um, it is an old feature of of international law and practice you know to do that somehow sometimes in international law very we are very idealistic we think that the united nations charter and all these amazing uh, multilateral treaties which emphasized for example pacta sunt servanda they they um they changed it all they changed this power politics but uh, but maybe if you are a sort of tsar of russia and you think what your predecessors accomplished and what your predecessors lost and what is your role in time then you know um if that is the main thing you value the, the, the in a way whatever has remained of the empire then then you know i'm not sure pacta sunt servanda is always your main concern okay yeah, maybe just to react to that i mean this is sort of an example of what Lowry described as the sort of schmittian undercurrent the fundamental question of who is a friend who is an enemy um but that's also embraced sometimes in mainstream international law. I mean, one example, the, the nuclear weapons advisory opinion back in 1996, I think, um, where the International Court of Justice said, well, we can't really understand, we can't really imagine circumstances in which the use of nuclear weapons would be justified unless the very existence of the state were in question. Uh, and that kind of limit question comes up only marginally for the most part in international law. But I think for powers like Russia, perhaps like China, um, sometimes that's more to the foreground. Uh, and so those power arguments exist in the background of international law, um, but some countries are more willing to, to bring them to the foreground. Wow, thank you very much, both of you. Uh, I would like to ask one more question and maybe then open the floor. You know, I can see we have uh, two questions already in the Q&A and I encourage our participants to, to post more questions. So we talk about the power, the exceptionalism, the, the reviving, the, the use of the language of international law. But Lowry, before we start, we talk also about double standards, you know, in the joint uh, state declaration, you know, the two powers, they talk, they, they criticize the double standards. And if I can say that, you know, I take this opportunity to speak on behalf of the voice of some of my students, you know, younger students who say, oh, come on, you always criticize, you know, Russia and China, and you have this pro-Western position but actually how different you know are they these two powers when they use uh the language of international law uh compared you know to to, to western powers if and we cannot do justice you know by using these uh, thick brass uh terms and my mind goes to the recent what we all experienced during almost two years now in the pandemic and i remember you know when i talk about the pandemic and how different countries uh, deal with the pandemic you know i, I was quite intrigued by the response response of my students saying, well, I, we don't see a big difference, you know, between what happens in US, you know, or in other countries and what happened in, in so kind non-democratic. And I don't, I, again, I didn't want to go down this road because I know it's very debatable regimes. So I was wondering, you know, what is your response to that? Are they actually, apart from the power uh, and the language of power and the concept of power, are they so different, you know, uh, from what we call the, the West? So you asked uh, asked me the first. Um, I I mean we have to keep in mind what is the main source of this talk about uh, double standards. It is um, I think in in the in the area of international security and war. It is basically the Kosovo and uh, uh, and the Iraq war. The Kosovo intervention and the Iraq war and we all remember those debates and we remember the argument about uh, maybe illegal but still legitimate which was really a way of getting away with it if you if you know that it's somehow illegal it remains a problem you know for 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 those other countries that maybe you know had this more Stalinist uh, uh, interpretation of what the United Nations Charter meant and everyone you know gets to keep their sovereignty somehow as a main principle and then it was for them it was of course um, 
you know, a unilateral attempt to change the rule of, rules of the game, you know, in the name of human rights and so on. Um, or, and, and, you know, it's, it's, it's a very old Soviet trope uh, to say that the West is hypocritical about human rights. Yeah, you say that, why don't you have proper elections? But at the same time, you know, the Soviets would say that there are homeless people near Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C., and, and now, you know, there would be some other argument, but the bottom line is that, you know, everybody has problems with human rights. So how come, um, you know, non-Western countries, you know, get in, in, in foreign policy to be criticized about, um, with, about it? But I, I, didn't, I, I watched yesterday um, a, a documentary film about the poisoning of Navalny. Uh, and 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 I'm still under the in, under influence of it somehow. If it's um, you know, it's I would still on the gut level, uh, we are all you know consumers of news. We make us some sort of image of of the West. I think that there are certain things that Western countries, Western governments, really don't do on a daily basis. Maybe I live in an illusion. You know, I I was. I, 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 I was 16 when the Soviet Union disintegrated and I ended up, you know, my country, of course, very much wanted to join the Western camp. So maybe it's psychologically necessary for, for me to say that we made a good decision. But I still think I, I genuinely believe it that, for example, a situation like Xinjiang, uh, uh, however much or little we know about it, what is going on there wouldn't be possible, you know, in in France or in, in even in the United States. So in this sense, yes, there, there is a lot of, uh, you know, foreign policy truth in it that countries are hypocritical. We all like to talk, uh, you know, it's a little bit like humans. We, we, we don't see our own flaws, right? It's, it's uh, for example, uh, Russia always said to the European Union that, uh, that um, you know, how come everybody is, is criticizing Russia for its human rights ne record, but, why didn't Estonia and Latvia give citizenship to their uh, Russian speaking, uh, you know, uh, settlers from the Soviet period? You know, why didn't they get it automatically? So, so, so there was always this two kvokve argument. However, I, I, I think that in, in, in countries like Ru uh, Russia and China, this is a slightly systemic problem still because they're not really, I think today they are not um, democratic countries in the Western sense. Maybe Russia wanted to be in the 90s. I'm not sure whether China ever wanted to be. Probably not. I mean, if you with one party rule, you cannot really, really be that. Um, so, so in a way, how can we expect the same kind of uh, perspective on on um, I don't know human rights, for example, if that is the political system? Yeah, maybe if I can just follow on. I mean, I think Laurie made. Good points in particular about sort of the use of force, the arguments about Kosovo and Iraq. And I think um, I think I'm right that uh, during the annex the invasion of Crimea, uh, President Putin actually referenced the Kosovo invasion as a kind of precedent. Um, and you can see similar arguments on the kind of double standards or uh, with regard to human rights and democracy. I mean, so I'm based normally in Singapore. Singapore has a, an internal security act that allows the government to detain individuals essentially without trial on a two year renewal basis. Uh, and Singapore used to get criticized a lot for um, its activation of that until, until 2001. Um, and from 2001 onwards, the United States kept its mouth shut. And, and Laurie's right that you don't have camps on the scale of Xinjiang, but Guantanamo Bay uh, and then Abu Ghraib and the series of things that happened after September 11, I think really eroded um, the moral capital of the United States. So that's, that's one um, great setback in terms of human rights, uh, that when the United States felt threatened, um, it basically ignored all sorts of rights, uh, human rights that it had helped um, establish. And countries like Russia or China will say, as China has, well, we face this sort of terrorist threat all the time, and that's why we do these things. Um, so that, that's one problem. On, on democracy, um, I think the whole, not, uh, I'm hesitant even to invoke the word, but the whole Trump phenomenon, uh, but not just Trump, um, Orban in Hungary and populist leaders elsewhere, is leading to a real rethink uh, in many countries of the nature of the attractiveness of democracy. 
which is kind of tragic. Uh, so I think for these reasons that the double standards aren't just justifications for other countries to violate norms, uh, but they're actually leading some countries to rethink uh, how, how much for granted we should take those norms in the first place. Thank you both very much. Uh, I wish we could continue that forever. So many things. I, I don't even dare to use the word democracy, I, I would say, but I can see that we have about six, oh my God, seven questions here. So I, do, I, I want to do justice, you know, to our participants. So um, I'll try to, to, to wrap up the, to, to, to couple the questions, if that's okay with you, you know. Uh, I, our, you can always you can also read Simon and, and Lowry the question. So I will start. Sorry for that. Now the system is not the best. Um, sorry to scroll up. Um, so I see first the question of Natasha. Although I saw Catherine had a question before, and it's about the annexation of uh, of uh, Crimea by Russia and the question of Natasha, my colleague here, an expert on Russia as well as, do you think they fully share views on separatism? Uh, so that's that's uh, uh, one question. Uh, I see also the question by Eduardo, one of our postgraduate students here from Brazil. Uh, he asked, I can think of examples of power protection from China and Russia towards the international legal order. Uh, do you believe that Russia and China will rise within the international legal order, saving some of its new features, such as creating saving sovereignty to cyberspace, where they have a particular interest? Uh, another question is about Tom Gisberg's idea of authoritarian international law. Uh, and the question is, to what extent it's a new phenomenon or inherently international law is authoritarian? Um, so that might be enough to... to that's to enough. That's what that. I want to say. That's enough, please, you know. Uh, okay, well, very, very, I'll try to be brief, but they're, they're great questions, each of which could be a, a seminar in, in itself. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think it has been interesting that countries like China and Russia, although they're part of the BRICS, they're part of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, um, there's always been a kind of frenemy element to their relationship, and that goes back to uh, Mao's relationship in the, in the 1960s. Um, and uh, on the sort of annexation, I think China and Russia, like other great powers, like other countries, are a little bit wary of um, breaking down norms that actually serve them well. Uh, and so we saw that with the West. I mean, just to go back to Kosovo briefly, when they went before the International Court of Justice, only one country said that what NATO did was right and justified, and that was Belgium. And the rest of the countries all made arguments, well, procedurally, the Security Council this, and uh, you shouldn't have jurisdiction that. Only, only Belgium uh, was um, bold enough, dumb enough to argue that this was a right, because I think others understood that if it was articulated as a right, then others could use that right also. Um, so I think that partly exp expresses the China's wariness of generally saying, yeah, sure, Russia wants to invade Crimea, that's just like Xinjiang or Taiwan. Uh, I, think, I think there was some hesitation there. Um, on the question of power projection, um, I do think um, that, uh, and I'll link this with Tom Ginn's work. Um, so both Russia and China, I'll focus on China. China does have an interest in developing international law incrementally where it, where it suits it and in other areas holding it back. So developing it incrementally um, the Belt Road Initiative I mentioned is a kind of um, economic push. It wants to expand its influence. It wants access to resources, supply chains, um, but it doesn't want to be constrained by third party dispute resolution mechanisms. It doesn't want to be interfered with through things like responsibility to protect. Uh, and so in some of these areas, you do see a kind of effort to project through, through treaties, through, through norms of um, trying to get access to natural resources, um, but also a desire to hold back certain aspects of international law, which is why I sort of make the argument that China's in many ways a conservative power, because the kind of vision of international law that China has really is a traditionalist, sovereigntist um, understanding of power uh, that um, international law ends at the borders. Uh, the problem, of course, as Lowry has already highlighted, is where exactly those borders lie. Uh, and for China, there was an interesting period when the Nine Dash Line in the South China Sea, it seemed to be claiming against all international law that it was claiming these as territorial waters uh, and then subsequently it retreated from that, uh, but, but to, to claim only the relevant waters. 
Um, so I'll, I'll stop there, Larry, over to you. Yes, I, I would want to expand on this um, historical point. Um, it, of course, the Chinese-Russia's mutual history in international law goes um, further back from the from the Soviet Union, and it's quite uh, quite an interesting one with with uh, the Treaty of Nerchinsk already in the end of the 17th century, uh, you know, and other other treaties that both countries concluded also regulating the the borders, and and you know there is this historical debate whether um, you know. Russia was it one of the U European colonizing powers towards China because in earlier times that there was also the view that Russia managed to take um, too much territories on the on the Russia's excuse me under Chinese historical whatever uh, control and uh, but but still the interesting phenomenon is that the two countries have of course agreed on their mutual border and this is quite important so for example when my father was a Soviet soldier then he, when he was taken to this uh, Soviet Far East. Um, I mean, we had a, there was a conscript army in the Soviet Union and then he, he at some point was also stationed in this uh, place near, I think, Amur River where, where the war between the countries, two countries had taken place in the, in the 60s, uh, also about the, about the border. Mm. Now about the separatism that Natasha is asking. Yes, fascinating phenomenon that in this uh, United Nations General Assembly voting of the Crimea resolution um, in March um, 2014, China abstains. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of interpretations are possible what this abstention means, but uh, but I think each country thinks about situations like that in terms of precedence, what it means, what will it mean to me? I mean, the, let's, you know, in the best case example is Kosovo, you know, the, the EU countries that have not recognized Kosovo have all irredentist fears. Yeah, so they, they simply haven't recognized Kosovo countries like Romania and Spain, for example. Yes. Um, and, um, and, and I think what, what I understand from Chinese discussions is that that um, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the way that the way Gorbachev and the Communist Party at that time managed it all in 1991, is like a lesson for China for how not to do it. You know, they did it wrong, and now Russia has to fix all this. Russia, you know, 30 years later, they have to wonder: Is Eastern Ukraine? Part of Ukraine, or is it still somehow part of Russia, or is it something, something third? And and therefore, I think the Chinese view is that you know things like that. If you're a true empire, you don't let things like that happen in the in the first place. If you can, if you can avoid that. And um, and then I think I I read from this Chinese abstention also this sort of silent criticism of Russia that well you still you recognized yourself that, that Ukraine is a separate country uh, in 1991. Uh, and this should also matter somehow. You, so it's, it's your problem. You, know, you, cannot, uh, you cannot make us all own, own this. Let's not forget that, that uh, Russia and Ukraine concluded even a border treaty in 2003, according to which Crimea was, uh, was part of uh, Ukraine. But all, of course, from Moscow's perspective, under the assumption that that Ukraine doesn't leave the, you know, the Moscow-led uh, regional alliance. Okay, I think there are a couple, um, we have 10 more minutes, if it's okay with you. There are some questions that they're directly addressed to each of you. So uh, for Simon, the first question I managed to scroll up from Catherine was this, although we don't use the word democracy, it says, he asks, you know, about this project, uh, new project in China, about the whole process democracy. Uh, I was not aware of that. I, 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 I need. I have to admit, you know, and what that implies. I don't know if you want to comment on that. And for Lowry, there is a question. Up, it goes back to what we talk all the time. You know, from Chris, he asks about the the understanding of uh, state uh, self determination. You know, and sovereignty. You know, uh, via the Russian uh, lenses. 
And generally, there is a question about the nature of international law, you know, how international law can be more, um, it can be considered more binding or something. I don't know if you would like to comment on that, you know, so it goes back uh, to you. Um, so, so briefly on, on China and, and democracy. So China's long experimented with sort of village level democracy, intra-party democracy. Uh, and so I think it's, uh, it partly speaks to uh, the idea that Lowry proposed, which I think is correct, that China watched with horror. I happened to be in China, in, uh, living in China in 1991, uh, and there was not a lot of press about what was going on in Russia, but I know there was a lot of examination. In retrospect, I know there was a lot of examination in the government. Um, and so China, rather than making the mistakes, I think, which they would regard uh, having been made in Russia, both in terms of, well, one, setting up a, a union of separate republics, which could then separate. I mean, that would never happen in China. Um, but two, that the sort of move to democracy uh, has, has been resisted in an interesting way. So you have this sort of party level democracy, you have village level democracy, uh, but an effort to avoid sort of mass mobilization. Uh, and this is uh, one of the interesting things that, that worries the Chinese government, I think probably a little less than it did in the past, but there used to be two fears in China. Uh, one was too much Western liberalization, which would lead to human rights and fragmentation. The other was too much nationalism, uh, which would sort of lead the state down a very dangerous path. Uh, and it's that, lab, that second thing that we see at the moment, episodically with respect to Taiwan, and that's what I think worries China watchers because there is a, a real danger, and I say China watchers both within and without China, um, because I think there is a real danger that if the, the rhetoric gets ramped up too high, uh, it'll be hard to pull back from the precipice. Laurie. Yeah, if I may, I want to say a word about this Tom Ginsburg's idea of authoritarian uh, international law. I, I think that um, we can divide the world, the, the regimes, into democracies and authoritarian and even totalitarian countries, but in all of it is also some sort of cultural, perhaps civilizational component. Namely, you know, even democracies can be quite different. In a, in, a, in, a, in a sense of how it works. Obviously, it works differently in India than in, 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 in Switzerland uh, in some aspects. And uh, so I think we, we have to keep that in, in mind. And, and, and I think what we see to trying to a little bit start starting to wrap up some of the ideas, I think Russia's and China's approach to international law is also some sort of uh, civilizational critique of Western universality that that somehow, you know, the West is saying international law is this, international law is that, don't violate it. Uh, but um, but they are in a way asking, you know, are you sure that, that this is, uh, first of all, that you can uh, say it for all of us? And, and, and secondly, are, are you sure that you don't yourself have a cultural bias? In other words, what if you're behind your quest for universality is just another civilization that was super influential in the history of humankind, you know, dominant and behind colonialism and mostly and everything, but, but that is not somehow the, uh, the only, only one out, out there. And I think this is the, one of the key, um, key questions because because one I, I was thinking further also about this previous question you know and about double standards and is it actually so that everybody is um, uh, as a sinner um, in and and therefore you know we are unfair if we only only criticize um, Russia and China I was thinking about this situation with uh, with migrants at the Poland at Poland's border so it's interesting that this uh, this initiative comes from um, President Lukashenko, who, you know, um, was declared a paria by the West, and now he's in a way behaving like paria. He says that, you know, I'm doing whatever I can, I can, I can do whatever. So what can you do? But in his approach is also a kind of uh, civilizational critique of, in a way, you know, hypocrisy in Europe or in the West because. Uh, because these these leaders they perceive it so that the West was always saying that you know human rights are universal 
the right to claim um, asylum was made universal. But in reality, it turns out that that uh, that there is a civilizational component in all of that, and and actually a, a hard fact that that you know many Europeans are not super excited in terms of getting endless uh, influx of migrants from uh, Middle Eastern countries, for example. So so I think uh, Lukashenko, after he was declared paria, he's now also laughing. He's saying that look, so where are your universal human rights if if uh, if there is no no access point to present those documents that I want to uh, get asylum, then, then you know, your, um, your claim that these are some sort of universal rights were, were hypocritical. So it's, it is a global conversation in, in that sense. Thank you very much for that. Uh, well, Lukas Seku is using the language of Erdogan, you know, exactly, it's the same language. Uh, against Europe and Europe put itself in this position, you know, so both Lukas Seko and Erdogan can use that, uh, those arguments against them. Um, I want to complete and finish here with one question, a final question to both of you, if it's okay. I'm working myself on a project about the bright side of international law. I know already it's, yeah, you, you smile, okay? Already it's problematic. Instead of the dark sides, I'm trying to think the bright side of international law. So although we spoke about power, double standards, hypocrisy, critique, I was wondering, you know, if you, if you were going, you know, to give a final comment, what would you say that, why still, still, why should we still believe in that relevance of international law nowadays in 2021? Just, I know you didn't expect that question, you know, but yeah, I, like, no, a, I think it's a great question. But no, I would and, like to take the opportunity, you know, to give this kind of note, you know, after all this discussion. So, but so I, I, I mean, I remain incredibly optimistic about international law. I'm, I'm more worried about things like climate change and our ability to deal with that than I am about sort of international law breaking down. And I suppose I'll wrap up, it, it partly addresses one of the questions as well. Um, because we were talking about power quite openly and maybe a bit of biography would help. Um, I got interested in law in general because I was interested in how power is regulated in society. Uh, and international law, it's just more obvious that the power dynamic is there, but all societies where there is law, underpinning law are questions of power. So I, I don't get depressed about the fact that international law um, has much more open debates, that its legitimacy is contested, um, that it's horizontally organized with these notionally equal states rather than vertically organized with a clear hierarchy. It's much messier. Um, it's, its legitimacy, as I said, has to be continually argued for, but that makes it all the more interesting. Um, and examples of hope even come up in the cases that we've spoken about. So Kosovo, this desperate desire not to make it a precedent, constrained behavior. Iraq, the fact that it was widely regarded as unlawful in 2003 meant that the US, Poland, Britain, and Australia did it almost alone. Compare that with the 1991 war where arguably the US actually made a profit. Um, so that applies to the West. It also applies to, to Russia and China. I think China has backed away from some of its extreme claims about the South China Sea arbitration because it understands that the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, which it's signed, and the Americans haven't, well, the Americans have signed but haven't ratified. So it understands that its self-interest lies in that direction. Um, and I'm kind of curious, and Laura can speak to this, but even Russia, I think, sees its self-interest lying not in just running roughshod over the institution of international law, but trying to use international law uh, and bend it, perhaps, but not break it. Um, so, yeah, I remain overall optimistic and fall back on Louis Henkin's old line that it's kind of remarkable, but it's true that most nations obey most of international law most of the time. Well, I think in, you know, with parallels to science fiction, if the earth would be attacked by aliens, then all these problems and skirmishes, what matters more, state sovereignty or, or human rights there, we'll, we'll figure that out and we'll, we'll somehow, um, you know, pull our resources together and maybe, maybe make a peace. But in the, in the meantime, you know, we, we still can have those those quarrels, but on the on the positive side, I mean, um, it depends on what your temperament is and how you want to see that. I mean, for for somebody, the fact that countries talk in, about international law a lot is still, you know, something worth. I mean, uh, that that Russia actually makes the effort, for example, in its uh, 
national security and foreign policy doctrines. There is almost no other country that I'm aware of that talks so much about international law. Yes, it understands it differently from than the Western countries, but it's still some sort of, you know, attempt to take, uh, you know, to take it somehow seriously. And there is also a realization um, in, in, and this Russia-China document proves that with this emphasis on, on state, um, you know, state sovereignty and territorial integrity that on the one hand, these big countries may appear as bullies towards uh, towards Taiwan and Ukraine, but, uh, but, but they are also worried, genuinely worried about their own huge territories. I mean, even uh, already the Soviet Union, as militarized as it was, couldn't really uh, guard every square meter, uh, you know, super effectively, you know, if, you, if you're just so big. So they still continue to need uh, international law in the future as well. Well, on that note, uh, on that positive or bright or whatever we call it note, I want to thank our speakers. I want to thank Laurie. I want to thank Simon. It's one almost 1 a.m. in Melbourne now. Oh my God. Yes, that, that clock is broken, but it's uh, one o'clock. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you very much for being with us that early in the morning. Thank you very much, Laurie from Estonia. I want to thank all our participants, the co-conveners of the World Crimes Research Group, Professor James Gunn, Professor Rachel Kerr. Uh, it was a great uh, pleasure to have you to engage in this discussion, you know, and to, to finalize this term with this truly intriguing conversation. So thank you all very, very much. And I really hope to see you in person when uh, the virus allows that. And uh, happy holidays and uh, may 2022 be a better year for everyone. You know, that's it. So, so that we will be able again to travel and to meet in person. Thank you once more. Thank you. That was really, really fun. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Maria. Good Thank to see you, Larry. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you all very much. Thank you all. Bye.